The Canadian Space Agency has played a pivotal role in human spaceflight for decades. Not only has CSA helped build the International Space Station, but they're the ones whose robotics have kept it running over 23 years. Now as we set our sights on the moon, Canada is once again stepping up with the next generation of space robotics, starting with the new Canadarm3 for the Lunar Gateway Station. In today's episode, I sat down with Ken Podwalski, the Gateway Program Manager at CSA. Ken shares some really cool things about what they're building for Gateway, and let me tell you, it was a lot more than I expected. So they're not just repackaging Canadarm2 from the International Space Station and shipping it to the moon. They're doing something really new and in an environment that is way more difficult than I ever imagined. I nerded out on this interview. We got to talk about the Lunar Gateway, Canadarm3, but we also got to talk a little bit about Canada's new Lunar Utility Vehicle, or LOVE as they affectionately call it, which is going to help build infrastructure on the moon's surface. And we talked about how all of these things that Canada is building is going to help us get to Mars. So here's Ken Podwalski from CSA to tell us all about their contribution to Artemis. My name is Ken Podwalski. I work here at the Canadian Space Agency. I've been here for the last 29 years. I came to the agency back in 95. At that time, I joined the Canadian Space Station program. Had the opportunity to, from the very start, uh, actually build the International Space Station. We've had a remarkable path in terms of you know, Canada's role in space robotics. You know, the, the, the career of the original Canada is remarkable. You know, astronauts had the, the confidence to be at the tip of it and to do things like Hubble servicing missions. And then of course with Space Station on the ISS, we really got to prove Canada had the ability to kind of step into the operational role and really take on a level of responsibility where the International Space Station would not have happened without robotics. It, it was, robotics were the absolute essential tool to assemble that vehicle in low Earth orbit. 23 and a half years of operations. That system is operated just about every other day. Very often when I speak about this, I'll, I will ask the audience, how many people today are driving a car that is 23 years old and has the kind of track record that we do on the International Space Station? And I mean, I'm, I'm remarkably proud to say that I was a part of that. As we were getting Space Station done and we got things built up to about 2011, conversations then started as to what was going to be the next thing that we were going to do. Everybody agreed, you know, the next stop was going to be Mars. That was, that was really going to be the brass ring in terms of what we're really trying to do. But as we started to look at that, how we were going to be able to prove that we were going to be able to take on a Mars mission, the right thing to do here was to really practice our abilities and capabilities. And the way that made sense was to do that at the moon again. Not just be able to land on the moon, but to actually have a sustainable way of a permanent presence in an orbit proximal to the moon, being able to do the surface missions, and then being able to build up our capability in a way that's kind of familiar to the International Space Station, but different, right? New context. We got to the point where we decided the gateway was the next step. So they set me up as program manager here at the Canadian Space Agency, running the gateway program uh, for Canada. And of course, Canada's role was gonna be the robotics. With Canadarm3, you're going to have a large arm. It's not going to be as big as the Canadarm2 because it's not going to be as big a vehicle. It's going to be about half the, half the length, so about eight and a half meters. And then we're actually going to have a smaller arm that's going to be about a little less than half the length, about three and a half meters, I think, off the top of my head. So that smaller arm is going to interact with the larger arm to be able to service it, but it's also going to be able to stack on the end of it and be able to extend our reach. There are a handful of operations today on the International Space Station where, so if we're doing free flyer capture, so a visiting vehicle that, you know, flying at 25,000 kilometers, we need to go and capture that vehicle and then attach it to the station. That one's a bit nerve wracking, right? And we want crew on orbit in place to do that because they have the best, you know, reflexes and motor skills to be able to do that on the fly, right? The other thing that's out there is being able to do uh, EBA support. So when a, a spacewalking astronaut goes outside of the vehicle, they very much want to know that there's somebody on the inside of the vehicle that they can talk to and make sure they guide them on how they're going to get somewhere and where they need to be and help them with the gentle movements to get them into position for them to do their job. When we look at Canadarm3, we're still going to give the crew that ability to do that. 
when we do things from the ground, well, now we also have to, also have to deal with things like communication delays, communication coverage. Crew is not necessarily going to be on the vehicle when we do these operations. So our degree of autonomy has to be improved here. So, for example, when we have to walk from base point to base point, and we all know how we've seen the Canadian robotic system, right? It has that inchworm capability to be able to walk around the vehicle and get to where it needs to, do, to go do its job. Well, walking from base point to base point is something that we will eventually start to script and automate. A lot of that effort actually can be done now with AI. Not that we're ever going to depend on AI to make the critical decisions. But using AI to put together all the necessary pieces, much like you would use your phone to, to give you a map route to, to your destination. The degree of space weather in deep space versus low Earth orbit is a much different thing. The reality is, is there are going to be there are going to be bad days when the right thing to do is not operate. The right thing to do is to hunker down and just close the blinds and let the weather pass. Right. There are going to be things like uh, dust. So lunar regolith. Lunar regolith is an interesting little animal. You know, we, we refer to it as dust, but it does not behave like dust. It behaves like a charged particle. It moves around with electrostatic properties. It can get transferred. So remember, Gateway is going to be a vehicle in, in a halo orbit about the moon. And we're going to have vehicles going down to the surface. They're going to be coming back covered in lunar regolith. That lunar regolith is going to be transferred onto the vehicle. Regolith is not like dust. It is essentially like, because it doesn't have an atmosphere to, to, to give it that erosion, to, to smooth it down and make it manageable. It's more like a crushed glass. It's very nasty when it gets into connectors because it has electrostatic properties. It's very nasty when it gets into mechanisms because it's very abrasive. And the interesting thing is, is we don't have a lot of experience with it. Our experience was limited to, you know, astronauts in EVA suits and cleaning those up and coming back, not with vehicles docking to each other and a permanent vehicle in an orbit. Now, as you as you look at this dust and how it's going to settle in on the vehicle, how are we going to how are we going to deal with that with our robotic system? We're going to be potentially picking that dust up, potentially getting it in our own mechanisms, potentially moving it around on the vehicle, all the while having to protect ourselves. Things like having filters on openings, having uh, complicated geometry wherein dust can't make its way into a bearing race. You know, even operationally, when, when a vehicle comes and docks to the gateway, we fully anticipate we're going to have to do a couple special things just in terms of our robotic system being anchored down and essentially covering its mechanisms by virtue of just being on grapple fixtures so that dust doesn't get in there. Another one is thermal, kind of a tough environment. The interesting thing about being in a deep space orbit is you're continuously facing one direction all the time. And of course, you've got a robotic system that's going to walk from the stark shadows into the bright sunlight and stay there for extended periods of time. So thermally, that's a tough design for our system. So these are all things that we're, that we're adapting and, and folding into the design. Half the game was just defining these requirements to really understand that environment, really understand the operations, the concepts we're gonna be using. Now translating that into design, we're at the preliminary design stage. We've had to do a lot of our engineering models already because we're testing these things, looking at how dust is gonna be working, looking at vibration tests, looking at, uh, contamination testing, looking at thermal testing, etc. Right, so a lot of that work has started, and it's a tough schedule, right? When you look at all the pieces that have to come together, but right now we see ourselves launching in 2030. So that is going to be on a logistics mission just ahead of Artemis 5. When Artemis 5 crew show up, we are going to have a fully checked out, ready robotic system that is ready to do, you know, if we had to do a spacewalk on that mission, we'd be ready to go. If we have payloads that are arriving on that mission, we're ready to go. So that's kind of our objective. You know, not to be forgotten, as we as we look towards the moon, Canada is going to be contributing two rovers to the lunar surface. We're going to do a small, you know, technology demonstrator rover, but then we're also going to do a lunar utility vehicle. You know, the job at hand is going to be moving things around on the lunar surface to prep work sites, to prep landing areas, to prep, you know, habitation areas where when crew come down to the surface, they're going to have what they already need at their disposal to be able to do their mission. 
the Canadian Lunar Utility Vehicle, right, is or the Love, right, is the is the term we're kind of using today. That utility vehicle is really kind of looking at okay, what is the job at hand that we're going to be signed up for? What are the requirements that we need to embrace here and go and design to? So they're really at that stage of the game. So very much a you know classic phase A, which is a which is definition. Getting in on Gateway, being part of the Artemis architecture, landing a Canadian astronaut on the lunar surface is our near-term goal, and we are focused on doing that. We have to deliver that. All of that adds up to the idea of going to Mars, finding the ways and practicing the methods and establishing the technologies and capabilities to put that all together internationally and to go to Mars. And you know what i hope our position our canadian position on this is that we absolutely want canada to be part of that mission